Welcome to our second season of How Does Your Garden Grow? Do you want to grow bigger and better veggies this season? The Holliston Garden Club presents Let's Get Down and Dirty with Brittany Overshiner from Upswing Farm. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, if you ever can't hear me or need me to speak up, just let me know. Um, I'm amazed at the crowd. You guys are awesome. It's inspiring that so many people are interested in growing their own vegetables. Um, you might think that because I'm trying to sell people vegetables, I would think of this as competition. Um, but in fact, the reason why I started farming is because I, in college, took two classes, nutrition, public health, and the American diet, followed by eating in the environment the next semester. And I realized how intricately our health and the health of our environment are related to how we grow and distribute food. And I believe that a localized food system where people are sustaining themselves or we're buying from local farmers is a great solution to some of the problems of industrial agriculture where food is coming, grown wherever, you know, if you look in the grocery stores, if it shows it's from Peru right now, it's from Argentina, it's from Israel, that's food that's coming from very far, it's traveling, it's being stored for a very long time, it doesn't have the same nutritional content at that point, and it has a lot of environmental impact by the time you're able to buy it at the grocery store. So, living in New England, eating locally at this time of year is perhaps not everybody's cup of tea. Um, we run a four season CSA share, so we're growing vegetables not only for fresh harvest, but also to distribute, store and distribute over the winter. So our winter share just ended. We grow things like sweet potatoes, potatoes, onions, carrots, winter squash, um, and then things in a greenhouse like spinach to kind of round out and get some of that fresh, exciting stuff in the share. Um, but the majority of what we do is grow uh, for distri distribution in the summer. I learned how to farm through farming. So I am not uh, trained like at a university or anything like that. The majority of farmers I know don't go, haven't gone to university for farming. They went for philosophy or <laughs> whatever and got down this path. Um, it's one of those trades where you learn by doing and by asking questions. And so most of what I know is from actual work, research that I've had to do in order to solve problems. And also I participate in a lot of um, work so workshops and sort of uh, professional development. No NOFA Massachusetts, a great organization in our state for organic farming, mm -hmm. um, and they've really helped me. Uh, so if you're looking for more, NOFA Mass is a great place to go after this. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so you can't totally see it, but this is me actually at my home garden. Believe it or not, I do garden at home, and I think of farming and gardening as very different things. So when I'm gardening, I take off my shoes, I take a deep breath, I have a glass of wine, and I'm like, and I take my time. Whereas when I'm farming, time is of the essence. Time is the most expensive thing. So I, everything that I'm doing is how can I be more efficient? How can I be more effective to get the same results? At home, these are like all my rescue plants, like plants that didn't get sold at the seedling sale. Like this is, I dump a big pile of compost right out my back door. Um, and so I just wanted to talk about the goals of gardening because the goal isn't always that highest yield. And I think people who are new to gardening can get hung up on the idea that like they have to get these immaculate vegetables with these crazy high yields and if they don't get that they're not successful and they shouldn't keep trying. Whereas I'm farming on you know seven to ten acres so if I have a failure, if I lose hundreds of bed feet of lettuce, it's no big deal because you know I have the perspective of a lot of other crops succeeding. So you want to grow the great healthy food, you're trying to do it a little bit more affordably than if you did at the grocery store. I think you're trying to do it without too much effort. It shouldn't be hard, and so that's some, some of what we're going to touch on here, is what are things you can do to make gardening a little bit more effortless, or some really good effort and then less effort. Um, and you want to enjoy the process. So don't put too much pressure on yourself to be successful. So whether you've been doing it for your whole life or this is your first time trying to garden, know that the process and like the value that it adds to your life to be engaging with nature in this way even if you don't get 20 pounds of tomatoes per tomato plant, it's still worth it. Um, and it's also a great way to teach our kids and to learn something ourselves. Um, so, and these are just some of the goals we'll talk about. Um, we're we're going to talk about 
uh, increasing our yields. So that's, we're going to talk about that in this, but I wanted to emphasize that it's not the only thing that's important about gardening. So we're going to talk about fertility. And in, under the aspect of fertility, we're going to talk about soil management. And soil ma management is something that I feel very passionately about. Um, I'd say it's, om you know, it's almost like a spiritual relationship I have with soil. I believe that there is something um, beyond our uh, comprehension of our relationship with soil and how important it is to our health. And so that's something we'll touch on a little bit. Um, we'll talk about water, plant spacing, variety selection, um, succession planting. So if you're a home gardener, you might think, oh, I plant my garden in May and I'm done. We plant at least every other week, usually every week until October. So there's lots of things you can kind of constantly be planting to fill empty spaces, try to have a continual supply of lettuce. That's something that's great to have at the home garden. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then double cropping and intercropping. What are you gonna do with all that space around your tomato plant when it's only this big? It's taking up this much space. There's actually useful space in your garden that you could be growing some food in quick crops like spinach that'll get out of the way and you can harvest once your tomato plant grows up. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but let's, it all starts with the soil. And now if somebody's in here and they're really into hydroponics, I am a soil person. So I just am not into growing without soil. I think it's great that it can happen. I think that there are people who believe that that is a part of the solution to local food and that is fine and wonderful, but I do not know very much about hydroponics and I am a soil grower. So I'm gonna talk about soil while we're here. Um, so we have the simplest definition. We have the, the upper layer of the earth. So it's like the very, very, it's like the, the tip of the fingernail of the earth or the very top layer of the skin of the earth um, where plants can grow. If you've ever, have you ever dug down deep enough where the soil changes color? It gets kind of orange or it gets kind of, that's actually a soil, you know, it's a really, uh, it's a rock material that's been eroded down, so it's like a sand or a clay, but it doesn't have uh, humus in it. It doesn't have organic matter in it. And that organic matter is a critical piece for plant production. So if there isn't that living and very dead, and we'll talk about that in a second, living and dead organic matter, you're not gonna have successful uh, plant growth. And so what we wanna talk about here is how are we gonna nurture that life and death in our soil to grow healthier plants? The percentages there are really interesting. So we're talking about organic matter as being really important, and it is five to 10% of your soil matter. So it's a very small portion of soil, 45% minerals, and then the 50% is space in your soil. And that's something that's really important to, to think of conceptually too. So air within the soil is important for feeding the ecosystem and even for plants in the soil. And then you need to have that space for water to go through. Um, it is obviously never at that perfect 25% ratio. Let's say it just rained and the soil is fully saturated. You might have very little air in the soil at that point, but it will, the water will percolate through and the air will come back in. So uh, just keeping in mind that uh, ratio that we have right there. Um, so the soil ecosystem, I. I would have drawn it for you, but I'm a terrible artist, so I did find this uh, picture. I think a lot of what people think of when they think of life in the soil is they think of worms, and they think of grubs, and they think of things that they can see. This, when I'm talking about the soil ecosystem, the majority of the life and activity in the soil is going to be the fungi and the bacteria, the protozoa, the microscopic organisms that are so diverse, it is equal to the entire diversity of species that are like macroscopic that we can imagine. So there's that many different kinds of species that are existing in the soil. And we are barely beginning, scientists are barely beginning to understand them. I am not a soil scientist. If I have to choose another career, that is my next career. It is definitely what I will do. Um, but it, what I, we need to know that they're there but we don't necessarily need to know all of their names or exactly how they all interact with one another. But these are the organisms that when we're trying to build a healthy soil, this is what we are trying to support. Trying to feed and nurture these microorganisms because they are the base of the food web. And they actually will interact with our plants. They will break down nutrients into more usable form for our plants. Sometimes they form relationships with plants where they'll actually create and exchange. So the plant legumes is the most common example. There's a bacteria that lives in the soil that will actually encourage a legume to absorb nitrogen from the atmosphere. And in exchange for feeding that nitrogen through, there's actually giving nutrients back to the plant. 
So that's like the macroscopic, really great example. Um, and it creates, if you've never seen it, creates nodules. They can get really, really big. And if you squeeze it, it looks like blood. It's red. And it's actually hemoglobin. So that's like the form of nitrogen that's being formed. Um, it's very cool. If you ever plant a pea or a bean, dig it up carefully at the end and see if you can find those little white nodules on there. Um, I always say, like, don't ask a farmer how big their nodules are, but we're <laughs> always looking. We're always digging up to look and see how big they are. Um, some of these insects can obviously be pests, right? So that's one of the things when we're, uh, when we're nurturing this environment, there are problems. Moles are obviously a problem for many of us, um, but those kind of get controlled on a, like a macroscopic level. Um, and that, but there's things like grubs, which can be problems in the lawn, or there's a wire worm, which is a little worm <laughs> that will actually like eat a hole in any root crop. And some farmers I know have wire worms so bad they can't even grow a lot of root crops. Um, but the theory is, is that there's an imbalance in the soil. When there's one organism that's really thriving, it means that there's an imbalance in the soil, and you want to try to move that soil more towards balance, where whatever the pest is that could be causing the problem, a predator, for that pest or a fungi that might attack because there's fungi that will actually feed on organisms and take them down. The, you want that diversity so that there isn't that Im imbalance with the ecosystem. Oh yeah, there's some nodules right here. They can get a lot bigger than that though. Um, go ahead. <laughs> um, so why does it matter? I've kind of been talking about this a little bit. Um, just in nature, they actually play a critical role in, in all of these cycles that are listed up here. So the carbon cycle, nitrogen, oxygen, um, actually phosphorus and water, and then just general uh, nutrient cycles in the plants, they are an important part. So carbon is, a, is, a, is something we all think about right now. Um, with global warming, there's more carbon in the atmosphere. Soils are actually capable of holding and storing stable carbon. And a living ecosystem in a soil is what does that. Every time you plow, every time you rototill, every time you disturb soil, there's actually carbon that's being burned that it goes into the atmosphere. So if we were to use farming practices and, and garden practices, but more farming practices that conserved soil carbon, we could actually start to bank carbon within our soils. And there are people who theorize that if we could, as, as a nation or as a, as a global community, farm in a way that conserves carbon, we could absorb a substantial amount of atmospheric carbon um, to slow or even reverse global warming. Um, so I've talked mostly about what, what's on this slide. Um, there's, I just wanted, to, I have this picture, this is my favorite picture we got on our farm last year. These are lacewing ed, eggs, it's a predatory insect. Uh, they feed on aphids. So whenever you see lacewing eggs, it's kind of like an apex insect. It's a, a note to yourself that I'm doing a good job because when the apex predators come in, that means that the, all of the species below them are kind of in place. Um, that's on a, a carrot crop that we're weeding right there. So it's. You know, nothing that we do is perfect with our soils, but we're always trying to work towards something better. Um, so these are the things that you want to work at. So when you're in the garden, you want to maintain moisture. And that doesn't necessarily mean watering every day, and we'll touch on that in a minute. Um, don't disturb their habitat. So we're going to talk about tillage. Um, it's a kind of a, a word that generally means disruption of the soil. And then feed your microorganisms. We'll talk about how to do that. And then avoiding harmful chemicals. I just put that in there. So if you're going to just pour herbicide on your soil, it's not just going to affect the herbs. If you're going to pour some kind of pesticides into your system, pesticides are usually non-target. So if you're attacking a pest and you're not, not using something like uh, Bt, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a bacteria that attacks just caterpillars. Um, most of the time, you're going to be disrupting other beneficial uh, organisms in the process. Um, it's going to take care of your soil, and it will take care of you. So we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about uh, these things. So mulching to maintain moisture. I'm sure everybody's heard about mulching. A lot of times people think about mulching to keep the weeds down. And that's great. That's an awesome benefit for mulching. That's a huge reason why we do it. It's labor saving on our farm. Um, but thinking about what you're mulching with at home. For us on the farm scale, we can't uh, necessarily always use organic matter for mulch. But ideally, if you are, have a source of affordable organic matter, it is great to use that as mulch for your soil because 
there is actually a level at the top of the soil, earthworms included, that utilize the slow decomposition where soil meets mulch. It's actually feeding your soil. So not only are you keeping the weeds at bay, you are also feeding that top layer, which then the worms dive down in, right? They're taking that nutrients down and they're pooping, right? Worm castings. And then they're feeding their bacteria and fungi that will actually digest that. It's creating that stable humus layer, and that's going to feed your plant's roots, which are growing right in amongst that activity. Um, the other thing you're doing is you're maintaining the moisture. So if the a bare soil is going to evaporate water like that. We see tons of bare soil in gardening. We see tons of bare soil in farming. It's how we've come as a culture to um, plant, and, and we do it on our farm all the time. Every inch of our soil is bare every year, but there's a movement of people that's moving towards no, no tillage, and that's by having mulch, and then instead of having to turn the soil over, you actually just put some more mulch on top, pull it aside, plant something else. Put some more, worried about fertility, put some compost on, and then add some mulch. So you're basically just layering and layering and layering, and that's something that you can do, whereas as opposed to having to weed every, three days, five days, seven days, if you really want to keep them down, you can just be adding that organic matter that is feeding the roots of your crops. Um, I've listed some things, grass clippings. You have to be careful if you're somebody who sprays any kind of chemicals on your lawn or you get them with chemicals on, it can burn, herbicides will burn your plants. Um, but I have seen a lot of really successful gardens just use the bag of grass clippings from, they just keep it in a pile and then once a year they spread it around on top of their plants. Um, I have a picture with wood chips in here because I love wood chips. I feel very strongly about wood. Wood is a very high carbon and it is really good fungal food. So if, have you ever like picked up some wood chips and seen those white mycelia like interwoven? Those are fungi digesting that wood and that, the, that's the base of really, really good um, food for plants and really good uh, soil. But that because there's so much carbon in those wood chips, the, uh, the organisms that are breaking it down also need a lot of nitrogen, which is very important plant food. So if you were to take those wood chips and incorporate them into the soil, all those bacteria and fungi that digest wood chips would activate, activate, and they would start consuming all the nitrogen that your plants want. So you'd actually see stunted growth if you were to incorporate into the soil. But as a top layer, it works pretty well. This is an, a perennial garden. So this is the start of a perennial herb garden. It has some annuals in there j just to kind of like fill the space while the perennials, um, you know, uh, grow into their own. Um, but the idea is, is that this is not going to be turned or replanted next year. So wood chips, you have to be careful if you're using wood chips because if you incorporate those into the soil, you will see reduced growth in subsequent years on the crops that you plant there if you're not very careful to not incorporate them. Uh, paper and cardboard are also really useful. You probably want to put something on top of them. They're not very attractive, but if you need to really smother something out, as long as there's not like a colorful inks or anything, because there can be toxic um, chemicals in those, it's a really good way to uh, maintain moisture and suppress weeds. Uh, and usually you can get it for free. And then there's plastics, and I'm going to talk about that. We actually use a lot of plastics on our farm, and I feel really guilty about it. I just read an article today about how there are... Um, people researching the bottom of the ocean right now like and they're finding all of the plastic, plastic in their bodies um, so we're going to figure out a way to get away from that um, and then compost if you have a fully processed compost and it's weed free and you can test if compost is weed free just put some in a bucket and water it and wait and if weeds grow it is not weed free you probably don't want to use it but if it's a weed free compost it actually can be a great mulch apply it nice and thick and then just add more onto it next year um, and that kind of makes the investment in compost feel a little bit more palatable so you're buying something that which can be costly um, especially if you're trying to find an organic compost if you're not making it on your own um, but giving it multiple purposes makes it a little bit more palatable to make that investment and so this is that, that germination. So this is a bale of hay. Um, this is a bale of hay that I paid for. Uh, and then it got rained on, and I realized I was not going to use it as mulch. Um, so this was sold to me as straw hay, um, but it was an oat straw, and the oats were able to set seed, and there was some seed in there. So if you're going to use something like uh, straw or hay or anything like that, you want to make sure that it is weed-free. So you could buy a test bale and water it and see if it grows any seed. That's a great way to do it. Um, or you're going to look through. So if you look carefully, uh, I let them deliver it without looking at it, which was my error. You can actually, see, you can't see it on the picture, but you can actually see the seeds. So that's something you want to check through, see if there's any seeds. Um, 
because you don't want to be adding weeds to your garden with your mulch because that's not a lot of fun. And so this is some of the plastic mulch we use on our farm. Um, I like to use plastic mulches that can be reused. So this is the, a picture of the second year that this is being used. We will use this same material this year. My hope is to get five years out of each, but it's still garbage at the end, so we, it's not a perfect solution. This is 100% mulching, so I don't have pathways with this. The, the only place where weeds can grow are right in the holes of the plant. And then actually, because this is our hoop house, there's holes where the um, hoops go into the plastic. Um, but it warms up the soil. So if you have a crop that doesn't want to have warm soil, it's not the best, but a lot of crops in New England really do want warmer soil. And I do have drip irrigation running underneath these. So if you're going to do uh, a mulch that's plastic and it's going to let water run off, you're going to want some kind of drip irrigation underneath, or you're going to have to know that you're going to be holding your hose to the hole and watering it in. And I'm going to bring it up again, but I'm going to say it now. Don't water your plants, water your soil. So. Your plants, especially tomatoes and crops like this that are susceptible to fungal diseases on the leaves, if you start like standing there with your hose, like I'm watering my garden, you're getting the plants all wet, you're actually creating an environment that's positive for fungal development on the leaves. And you don't want that. You want the fungi in your soil. You don't want them on the leaves of your plants. So when you're watering, you are deliberately soaking the soil around the base of your plants. And it is a soaking. So if you think about it, the best kind of rain would be mm, five. 5 a.m., good inch over the course of an hour and a half, two inches, get that soil nice and saturated. Then the sun comes up, everything dries out, and it's a cool breeze all day long. Um, <laughs> Where's this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? Um, but that's what is best for plants. And obviously, nature doesn't always provide that. But if you're thinking about when you're watering, you really want to soak that soil, um, get that moisture in there, and then let it get dry again. So however much you might love watering your, you know, you might love that glass of wine and watering, do something else in your garden besides watering if the soil doesn't really need it because your plants can get oversaturated with water, and you're also going to start flushing nutrients out. So a lot of the nutrients that are available to your plant are water soluble. So if you put too much water, you're actually going to be losing a lot of the nutrients that are available to your plant just through runoff, essentially. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, this is another material we use. It's called weed mat. It's kind of it's kind of like a fabric, but it is polypropylene. Uh, it's a little bit more malleable. It can uh, adapt better to undulations in the soil. Um, and we just basically plant in a row and we pull it center to center. So if you have a row of this is cucumbers and zucchini here, um, and a row over here. We measure it so that when we roll it out, it just goes up to each plant. And then we just pinch it. We use a metal staple, so staple it into the ground. Um, it's a little bit of labor up front, a little bit of labor to pick it up. But uh, the plants are then producing fruit that's on a protected surface. So things like cucumbers, if that fruit is developing on the soil, all those lovely active microorganisms in your soil and insects can actually start to cause some damage on the fruit. So that's another benefit of this mulch. Um, and this we do run drip as well. We don't have really great irrigation on our farm. Um, so we use drip pretty much only on stuff that we run under plastic. This is, though, um, more permeable. So this material we also chose because it will actually let water go through. So I like that as opposed to the plastic that will let it run off. And I just want to see how it looks when it grows up. So this is some uh, zucchinis with the tomato. So it keeps that clean path. Like this path is still probably a little smaller than I would want. You know, if we had all the space in the world, I would space a little bit so there's more room for the crew to get in between. Um, because it's zucchini and cucumber, so you pick those at a minimum every two days. Um, you can see right there, there's one that somebody missed. You can tell it's bright yellow and on the ground. Um, but yeah, this is, it's just sort of a nice... Uh, example of how we d you do have to weed a little bit in between the plants, but otherwise there's not much weeding to be done. And then this is just a standard plastic. We have a plastic layer we roll out with a tractor. My first time I ever laid plastic, I laid 1,500 feet by hand. I got really good at like using my arm as a shovel as I crawled on the ground. Um, I find the plastic layer a lot more effective. But if you're doing it on a small scale, it's not that hard to lay out some plastic like this. My problem with this plastic it is definitely single use, and it definitely goes in the trash at the end of the year, and that makes me really sad. There is a material called Biotello. It has been approved for organic use in Europe. Um, it does decompose in the soil, but you need a biologically active soil. So if your soil doesn't have a lot of organic matter and it's not very active, you're probably going to have to remove that um, as well. 
And this is the last picture I wanted to put in here because this is a mulch that we tried to use which didn't work for our farm but I think could be very effective for a home gardener. It's a paper mulch so it actually degrades very rapidly. It is approved for use in organic systems. Um, it's a company out in Colorado that makes it. Um, we could use our plastic layer to lay it and it's fully permeable for water. So when it gets rained on it, it's more like a cardboard kind of material. It's going to let that water go right through. For us, the issue that we had was it, um, it degraded too quickly. So the actual seams where we laid it down came off and we could like peel it off like a band-aid. So if there was any kind of wind or anything like that, the remedy there is to just put a little bit more soil on top. But as soon as you have a system like this where there's soil in between, there's weeds that need to be managed in between. So if you're going to do something like this, you want to think about what, what mulch are you going to put in the middle? Are you going to use leaves would be a fine mulch in the middle. You can always rake leaves off. That's something I didn't talk about. We have so many leaves in New England. You have to be wary if you use a lot of oak, it can be acidic. Pine needles can be very acidic, so you can affect your soil that way. But some good maple leaves chopped up a little bit, if you have a leaf shredder, uh, can do a really good job as mulch in your garden. And those are also going to feed um, the organisms in your soil. And then I have this slide on here because this is a bed shaper on uh, one of our tractors. And a bed shaper is a really cool tool for making the beds to plant into. So everybody's heard of a rototiller, right? It's a pretty common tool. There's lots of walk behind rototillers. Um, pretty much it's taboo if you care about your soil to use a rototiller anymore. And so that's something I started with only a tractor and a rototiller the first time I was farming and we got by we grew lots of great vegetables um, but what a rototiller does and we can go ahead and go to the next slide is it disturbs the soil in a dramatic way so if we have this like wildly diverse ecosystem in that top six inches top foot of our soil that's feeding our plants they actually have a place in which they thrive within those inches. So there's a species that exists here and here and here and here and here and here. And when you come in with that rototiller, you go like this and you put everybody in a different spot and it kills a lot of organisms. Not all, not enough. They all can rebuild, right? That's why we haven't like destroyed our soil even though we've been rototilling and plowing it um, for a really long time. But it's not the best for the ecosystem. So what we are trying to do on our farm and what you can definitely do in your garden is think of ways that you can not invert the soil, not disturb the soil, allow the soil to exist as it is, which is very counterintuitive to the way a lot of us think of preparing a garden. Like you go in and you shovel up the whole thing every year. What I want to tell you is that maybe you don't have to do that every year. So maybe through that mulching and through that layering, you're going to be able to have a garden that doesn't have to be turned over once a year. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Plowing is the worst. Look at, that's me plowing or Aaron plowing, somebody plowing. Uh, it still has to happen sometimes. So at least on our farm, the way we're farming right now, um, we're plowing in a cover crop right there. It is a huge, it was like this tall cover crop rye vetch. There was no way we were going to get that incorporated into the soil. What we're sacrificing when we plow like that we are sacrificing 7% of any organic matter that lives in that soil, burned off like that. So not, you know, there's 5% total, but of that 5%, 7% is about what disappears because we're adding so much oxygen in. Oxygen's gonna feed the organisms that are gonna utilize some of that organic matter and burn it away. So we lose that 7%. For us, we need to have a cover crop. This is a slope. We can't have it not growing plants over winter. It would erode. And we're adding in a lot of green manure, which is organic matter when we're incorporating into the soil. So it's a trade-off. We have to have this cover crop. We're feeding the soil by adding the green manure back in. And so we accept that in order to do that and have it break down effectively, we're going to have to plow. Um, and that's tying into what we were talking about, the wood chips. So if I were to just turn this cover crop in and try to plant the next day, all that not yet decomposed organic matter in the soil is going to compete with my crops because those the microorganisms that are breaking that down are using nitrogen and they're using the nutrition that my plants need to grow. So you want to make sure you don't have living and definitely not not decomposed yet material. Some is okay, right? A little bit is okay, but a lot is, is going to tie up the nutrients that your plants need to grow. Um, but an alternative is using top tarps for the occultation. The occultation is a really fun, cool thing. It's very trendy. Lots of small farmers are doing it. Um, I, you know, 
I jumped on the bandwagon and did it too. Plastic again, shame on me. Um, but essentially what you're doing is smothering on a larger scale than like the cardboard. And so what you're doing when you're smothering is instead of inverting the soil or disturbing the soil, you're just killing the plants because they don't get any sunlight and they die. Because we all know plants need sunlight so they can photosynthesize. It takes a while. They hold on for a long time. So this picture was taken in April. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. And then that is May. It's about a month later. So there wasn't actually, it was a very cold spring, so there wasn't a ton of growth on the rye. Sometimes you'll get twice that amount of growth in that amount of time. So it took that amount of time, but you can see the difference right there. You can see I'm very happy about the results. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. One more. That's another example. Looks so cool. So this is what I'm really happy about. So you can see kind of see these like crumbly bits right here that's all worm casting so like basically those plants are dying and the worms are like um, 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 and they're gobbling it all up so there's this frenzy of feeding underneath so anytime you have you know you've seen it in the lawn you left something out too long and it's like ah but then there's worms all underneath it that scurry away that's actually really great soil right there you might like stick a flower in and put a little mulch and <laughs> call it a day um, but that's what I was really excited about, and that's something that we have seen, I definitely have seen increased in yields because of using this practice instead of plowing or rototilling to prepare the beds. Um, we planted our potatoes into a system that was done essentially like this this year, and we were getting about three pounds per row foot of potatoes, which is about a pound more per row foot than we'd ever achieved um, otherwise. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there. Um, the plastic is not super attractive, right? So if you're doing it in the home garden and that is something that you're worried about, maybe doing something where you can mulch over it and then pull the mulch off and use it somewhere else. You know, there's ways to make it look good. Or you can just say, it's just for a month. You'll be fine, neighbors. Um, but yeah, so this is something that I feel really good about. And there's a the couple other plants to point out. This is the vetch. That's a, a legume that's really good at feeding uh, nitrogen to the soil. Um, and then we'll go to the next page. I do have a video in here. Can you see if there's a play button on the screen? Because I think it'll just go, yeah, it'll just go to the next slide. So this is this year, so this was two years ago, and we basically just moved it over and let it knock down the next section, and that was the next section that we planted. Um, but uh, just an example of that, it's not actually that, when you're using tarps, it's not actually that hard to put it down and then move it. Um, and so those, it, it ties into what we're talking about is when you feed the soil. So those decaying plants are feeding your soil. So you're feeding those worms, you're feeding those microorganisms. So when you're adding just fully decomposed compost to your soil all the time, if it's fully decomposed, there actually isn't much food for the ecosystems in your soil in that fully decomposed compost because it's kind of already done. It's been digested you know, down through the chain. So figuring out a way that you can add a little bit of decomposing material to your soil without incorporating it, that's why I'm going to mulch. Mulch is a really good way to do that. Um, that's a really good way to feed your soil. Um, living plants are also a really great way to feed your soil. So your vegetable plants are actually helping to build the ecosystem. Soil that is bare is lacking in that plant soil relationship, which is actually natural, right? Where, uh, where except for the desert, and even there, there's like algae that's covering the soil surface. In nature, do we see bare soil? Nowhere. Life comes in and it takes off because that plant life is a part of the ecosystem. So if we're thinking about our gardens, I mean, how many people's gardens is just soil right now? You know, mine, there's places in our farm that's just soil, you know? There's actually an opportunity between growing seasons, October through April, to nurture that system and nurture the environment that's growing your plants. And we're going to get to a few slides of how you can do that with cover crops um, that are not hard to manage. Um, and then the other thing is that actually fertilizers and, and creating a balance with uh, proper pH can, can help enhance the ecosystem. We'll talk about that in a little bit more. So this is the picture I want to show you. So this 
Can anybody tell me what it is? It's maybe not the clearest slide. It's very green, right? This is something, if you're looking to feed your soil, the more green you can have, like the better you're doing. So thinking about having as much green for as long as possible in your soil is a really good thing. This is actually a mature stand of fall carrots. There are some weeds in here, but then what we've done is we've actually planted its oats. So oats is an excellent, excellent cover crop for the organic farm. You can plant it fairly late. I believe we seeded those oats um, the 21st of August. This is probably six weeks later when we took this picture. And what they've done is they've grown up. The carrots are already established, so they're not competing for nutrition with the carrots. They're just in the pathways, so it's like as if there were just row crops. Um, and what they're doing is they are creating an ecosystem below them, and they're also absorbing some nutrition that the carrots didn't use. And that's going to be within their bodies, which are going to die because they can't survive the winter. So the reason we plant these oats is we're going to take advantage of the fact there's soil that can be supporting plant life that is photosynthesizing, that is creating a nutrition source for the soil organisms that exist, and it's going to actually feed next year's crop. We can go ahead and do the next slide. Sorry. This is, we had beets here and we just picked them. But look how much green is still on our farm. Like this is a really big check plus. We did a really good job. We actually got really great yields of beets too. Um, if you're doing a system like this, you do have to make sure you're maintaining moisture. You might have to water a little bit more. There's just more plants that are going to be using moisture and respiring, so you want to make sure that you pay attention to water. But something like this is something you could do on a home scale. Oats are really cheap. Like I buy a 50-pound bag of oats for maybe $30, certified organic. So you probably don't need 30. We could buy a bag. We could all take a couple <laughs> scoops home and we'd be all set. Um, and it keeps for many years. It's got really good viability. So um, that would be something that you could kind of have. On, you don't have to buy 50 pounds at a time. It's just really cheap and easy to do it. Um, have on hand, you have a little bare spot. You have a pathway. Have a little bit of oats growing. And especially when you know they're going to die in the winter, and you're not going to have to necessarily dig them up. That's a really easy thing that you can do um, to enhance uh, the life within your soil. This is, it's, it's not very clear here. I was just trying to show this is probably, there's still sunflowers, but it didn't frost until November that year. I would guess this is still some, sometime in October. This is our last field planting of spinach. Um, and it's fairly mature. And you can see just the hint of green. We've just planted the oats. So you do want to make sure there's a little bit of establishment in your crop before you plant an oat like that. Um, but we were able to get oats about this big before they wintered killed. And so even, even a plant that big that's growing for maybe six, eight weeks before it's winter killed is creating that ecosystem and life underneath it. And you can even test it. Is there a weed growing in your garden right now? There's some weeds that can kind of thrive or ones that come up. You'll see there's earthworms underneath that and not over where there's nothing growing. So that's an indicator that that's, they're, they're drawn to the life that's within the soil. And these are a couple other cover crops. Cover crops is like, this is, think about it like you're like giving your horse a treat or something. Like if you're a pet owner, like if you're a t somebody who cares for the soil, having a successful mature stand of cover crop is like a really, like, you know you're doing good by your soil or by your pet. Uh, these are mixes of grains and legumes in the, over on the right or left for you guys um, is oats and peas. So that's actually a fall cover crop that will die down and we can plant into that easy. And then this is actually a spring cover crop. It's a mixture. The red is crimson clover. It's a really excellent clover that sometimes overwinters, sometimes doesn't in New England. Um, but you can plant it very late. You can plant it as late as um, uh, October 1st, and you can still get it established enough to make it through the winter. And then vetch and rye, the same. Um, there's tons of organic matter in there, and there's a ton of life in that soil. Both the clover and the vetch fix nitrogen in the soil. So if you can and you have the fortitude to plant a legume uh, grain mix, if you're not going to be growing very long in your garden, it's going to look beautiful. Look how lovely that is. This is June, so if you're an early gardener, you're going to have to clear out some of your garden. But it's like one of the best foods if you're going to do a crop of tomatoes, you're going to do a winter squash, or you're going to do even heavy feeders like zucchini, doing something like this beforehand. Uh, knocking it back is a little bit of a challenge. You, if you even have a sharp knife, if it's a small enough garden, just cut it right at the base. That's going to knock it back. You can turn it over with a shovel. You could put a 
piece of cardboard over it to kill it back. But cutting it at the base rather than just smashing it over is a good way to kind of knock a, a cover crop like this back. Or everybody should have a scythe. You can all get a scythe. Um, here's the, the caution that I've already been cautioning you all about. Don't incorporate the organic material in the soil that has not been fully decomposed if you want to plant right away. So you want to make sure that stuff is broken down. Um, and this just the same thing. It activates different microbes that are going to use up the nutrients that your plants need. But once they're done, their excrements are going to be really good for your plants. So it's just a timing thing. And I didn't do anything really specific here. I actually don't know a ton about chemicals, except that everything I hear about them is terrible. So I just kind of steer clear. I've only farmed organically. Um, it's hard, right? Farming is hard. Gardening is hard. Like there's a bug that's on your broccoli, and you like tried so hard to grow this broccoli, and there's green worms all over it. Um, before you go out and get any pesticide, do a little bit of research. Um, See if you can identify the pest. A lot of times UMass might help you with that if you want to contact UMass. You can call me, you can send, text me a picture. I, if I know what it is, I'll tell you. Um, and then the internet is a really great source for looking up what is the best organic solution to this pest. And it's not all, I, you, I'll give you a tip. So I, if you just Google, there's so many gardening forums and some of them are lovely and some of them are black holes of misinformation. If you Google green worm on cabbage extension and put it in quotation marks, it's going to give you an, a university extension paper. And a lot of times you can get to some more sci scientific information that way. That's how I have like navigated the internet as I Google search um, stuff like this. Um, and you can, we'll get to the, the label. There's an OMRI label, organic material, material, Oh, man, why can't I think of it? OMRI. If you ever see OMRI, it means it's approved for organic use. So there's probably nothing really, almost likely nothing really harmful about it. Um, so that's a great label. It's big and black. We'll, we'll show you. Go ahead. So my soil's healthy, but what about my plants? So this is something that I, and I, and I know I'm sort of running out of time. I'm going to go a little bit over. I don't know exactly how much time I have, but I'm just going to keep going until you guys drag me out the door. Um, <laughs> These are actually not the same tomato plants we saw earlier. This was the previous year, but it was the only uh, uh, picture I could find. Um, just because you have healthy soil doesn't mean everything's going to work out. So we're going to talk a little bit about other things you can do um, to have the most success in your garden. Um, so what do plants need? They need air carbon dioxide, they actually aren't competing for you with oxygen. I, <laughs> I had to look it up because I was like, do they use oxygen? Um, and they don't really use oxygen, at least not through respiration. Um, they need water. They need a growing medium, and I put that in there for those of you who are into the hydroponics. Like, technically, they don't need soil, but yes, they need soil. And then <laughs> the nutrients. And so the nutrients, I put kind of the, I'm sure there are probably other nutrients that they use, but this is the, nutri the nutrients that anybody's going to be examining when they look at a soil test. So you have your macronutrients. Think of it like your uh, carbohydrates or your vegetables, if you think about your diet and your plate, what would you eat? This is like the cal a lot of calories are coming from this stuff. Um, it's not actually calories, so it's just an analogy. Um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, so NPK is something you'll see on a lot of fertilizers, and we kind of ha culturally have gotten really excited about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. They are also, they're very important, but calcium, sulfur, magnesium, Carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are also very important. So the, the carbon, the oxygen, and the hydrogen are coming from water and air, right? So that's kind of taken care of. Some carbon might come from the soil, but it's less likely. But calcium is also a really important nutrient. Has anybody ever grown tomatoes and had a little black spot on the bottom of every single tomato? That's a calcium deficiency. It's, a real, it's called blossom end rot. It's pretty common. It's a good indication that you need a little bit more calcium in your soil. Um, it also could be that your plants were too dry and there wasn't any water-soluble calcium available. Um, but calcium is a really important uh, nutrient for your crop. And then the micronutrients like iron and boron and manganese, uh, zinc, copper, molybdenum, and nickel are also important nutrients for your crop. That doesn't mean that you should go start pouring those things onto your soil. These are micronutrients, so there's very, very small trace amounts that can have a big effect. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about how to balance your soil. Uh, to get to make them available. There are people who believe that you, there are some deficient soils and that 
there are just not enough of these nutrients and that you should bring them in as like rock minerals. Um, but New England soils tend to have all of the trace minerals. We actually have fairly good soils, perhaps full of rocks and slopey and like other challenges, but nutrition wise, usually it's all there. Um, so soil testing, if you've never done a soil test, you can do it for 25 bucks from UMass. You can also get way more expensive soil tests that are maybe a little bit more uh, specific. Um, but if you're just doing a home garden, going all the way to the top uh, probably isn't worthwhile. Um, the major thing you're looking for is how much organic matter do you have in your soil and how, what's the pH. So pH testing, you can get litmus tests at home and you can actually test, you know, you make a little solution and you test it. Um, Adjusting pH is really important. If you have a very acidic or a very basic soil, usually in New England we have very acidic soils, or too acidic for plant growth, it essentially is an indication that there are nutrients that are not available to your plants. And so we have a little graph. We can go to the next slide. Um, oh, this is our soil. So let's go forward one, and we might go back. Um, that was our soil test. Yeah, this one's good. So this is a really good, it's just been like dancing around this the whole time. Um, this is a pH scale, and these are all the nutrients we talked about, and this is showing what their availability is at the different pH levels in your soil. So you can see if your pH is 5.5, which is really common a lot in New England soils, having something like a 5 or a 5.5, you're going to have plenty, you're not going to have quite enough molybdenum, you'll have plenty of copper, boron, manganese, and iron. So if you're something like a potato or a blueberry plant that thrives on some of those nutrients and doesn't need as much of the other ones, you're going to do okay in an acidic soil. But then you get up over here, magnesium is low, calcium is low, sulfur is low, potassium, and then phosphorus and nitrogen are also fairly low, and those are some really important nutrients. So you can see adjusting to your pH to that 6.8, which is like that desirable one. You're going to get the most of the fat bars on all of these. So that's why you're trying to aim between that 6.5 and that 7 um, for your pH. And that's just something I think people maybe not, might not know about is the, is the uh, availability of nutrients because of it. Um, so if you do only one thing because of this class, maybe test your pH. Don't just go adding lime willy-nilly because you can also you know, do the wrong thing. If you just assume your soil is acidic and is not, you can overload on calcium. Um, but doing a pH test is a really great way to cr uh, create a mineral balance. And then we can go back one slide just to look at that soil test. I don't think we're going to be able to read it. Yeah. Um, this is a soil test. This is what they send back to you. Um, the second page didn't come up, but I actually asked for recommendations. So you can ask for specific recommendations in your soil test. So if you really want to be good at growing tomatoes, you get to check these boxes and say, my soil for tomatoes. And they'll say how much nitrogen to add, how much lime to add, if you need to add phosphorus or potassium. So it'll give you those specific instructions. So if you really want to, it's 25 bucks. If you really want to know, you know what you need to add for lime, it's a really good investment. Um, and then it also tells you your micronutrients. So you can see, like, we had, like, just enough of some of them. They're all kind of within the range. A lot of times when you adjust the pH, you can make some of those more available. So this is just measuring what's available, not what is actually present. So the first thing to do is adjust the pH and then see if you need any more. We can go to the next one. Um, no, you're good. You're good. So that was just the adding lime. When you add lime, Usually you only want calcitic lime, not dolomitic lime, and you want to make sure that you are um, putting the most pulverized form down as possible if you need an immediate change. So think of it as like the surface area of each little grain that the calcium is being pulled off of by the water, which is going to affect the pH of your soil. The smaller it is, the more surface area for the water to get it. So if you get like the big granulated stuff, it just means that it's going to uh, be added to your soil more slowly and the pH is going to change slowly over time. So if you're only trying to adjust it a little bit, maybe the bigger granules will work. But if you are like, oh my gosh, my soil is at 5 and I really need it to be at 6.8, um, you're going to want to go ahead and add like the more granulated pulverized dust. Um, so compost is a really good thing to add to your soil. Just to note that the nutrients, some are only available after subsequent years, depending on the state of the soil. So if you are adding it for like all your nutrition needs for your plants, um, just know that there might not be enough nutrition from adding compost um, in the first year, and you might want to supplement. Um, if you have a really high... Uh, organic matter and you have a very healthy ecosystem, compost can be sufficient and you don't have to add other nutrition. Um, and just so you know, humus, 
I'm reading like a really nerdy book about soil right now. Um, that's trying. I, I'm trying to really conceptualize the um, chemical uh, reactions that are happening in soil. Um, but know that humus, which is that stable thing in compost, has a negative charge. And so things like calcium, which exists as a positive charge in the soil, gets drawn and can be held by the humus. So it can actually hold, it's, it can hold on to some of those elements and those nutri nutrition or those sources of nutrition in the soil. So that's a great way to kind of build your soil's capacity to hold nutrition for your plants. And then it also diversifies the pore space. If you have a really dense, heavy soil like a clay, it's going to kind of wedge its way in between. Clays are like little bricks that like literally little microscopic, almost microscopic bricks that lay on top of each other. And you're just going to wedge it in there with like odd shaped things and that's going to create more spaces. Um, and with a sandy soil, which a lot of soils around here are kind of sandy, um, it, those are bit like big round balls. And so there's, the water just kind of pours through and the nutrition pours through. So putting little odd shaped things in between stops that water from running through and catches some of that nutrition. So it helps you either way, depending on your soil. Um, I add fertilizer every year to our farm. Uh, our I don't know if you saw from that test, the fields that we're on is very, very high in phosphorus and very, very high in potassium. Um, you can have excess that can be damaging to your plants, but really what it is is it runs off and it can affect water bodies. So there's such a thing as phosphorus toxicity in the water. Um, so what I added last year was just a feather meal. So literally ground up feathers, you know, probably from meat processing and it's just got nitrogen in it. It doesn't have the phosphorus and potassium. Um, but there are a lot of organic fertilizers that are available on the shelves. Um, and you can kind of apply, even if you don't do a soil test, you can feel more confident when you apply organic fertilizer that it's actually going to be utilized and there's not going to be a lot of runoff because it's not in excess. So NPK, have you ever, se you guys have seen 10, 10, 10, right? Everybody knows 10, 10, 10. That just means 10% by weight of that bag. So if it's a 10 pound bag, 10% of it is nitrogen. So one pound of nitrogen in that bag, 10% is phosphorus, 10% is potassium. One pound, one pound, one pound. Um, so if you're looking to put a pound of nitrogen on a thousand square feet, it's got enough, but maybe you don't need all that phosphorus and potassium. And so you're just adding these excessive nutrients, uh, which are probably just going to run off into the water. On the garden scale, it's not as big a deal. Um, but use, in organic fertilizers, usually you're going to see something like a 534 or an 822. So it's just a lower percentage. Um, manure? What about manure? So if you're going to add manure to your soil, the reason I didn't bring it up is if is it's actually fairly strongly regulated for farms. So if you're going to just spread manure on a field, you can't just grow a crop right away. And it's not just that it's um, actually going to burn your crops. There's enough nitrogen it can actually cause damage. Um, it's a pathogen issue. So like, you know, you wouldn't eat out of a toilet bowl basically is the issue. So um, what I say is having a fully composted manure is really great. So if it's allowed to decompose in a separate area and then you're going to apply that to your soil or even just partially decompose and put it on in the fall and make sure it's incorporated so that your soil can feed it. So I think manure is fantastic. I think animals are a really important part of like the whole ecosystem process. It's just a timing issue. So making sure you're not applying the, the rule for a farms is 120 days. So if I were to put something that wasn't like a certified compost, I have to wait 120 days before I pick from it. Um, and this is just a label I wanted you to see. There's the 533 right there. Um, it tells you your total nitrogen. That's 5%. Um, so this was probably, a t is it, oh, four pounds. Wait, so am I getting that wrong? It's probably just me doing bad mental math. Um, it's percent by weight. Um, oh, yeah, 5% by weight. Um, and then it says over here it contains slow-release nitrogen from hydrolyzed feather meal. So this is telling you that of your nitrogen, some of it is actually going to be slow released over the course of the season. And this is a good thing. If you have a nitrogen like ammonia, which is what they use on a lot of farms, it's like very volatile, right? Like that's a part of why there's all these algae blooms down in the Gulf of Mexico is because people up along the Mississippi are just pouring all this volatile nitrogen on and most of it gets rained off into the waterways and then it feeds the algae that live in the um, Gulf of Mexico. So 
you want to have some kind of stable, slow-release nitrogen that's going to feed your plant over the course of the season. It's not just going to wash away after the first few weeks. So always check for that in a label. You want a little bit of slow release. Um, this one is interesting because it's talking about how it actually has some microorganisms in here, like the bacteria that are going to be beneficial to your soil. So if you feel like your soil is low in organic matter and might not be very active, look. this is called inoculating. So looking for something that has actually some source of inoculant to uh, just start to populate your bacteria. Uh, your uh, ecosystem is a really good idea. Um, go ahead. And then foliar feeding. Uh, we do a lot of foliar feeding on our farm, partially because we don't have irrigation. So if we know we're going through a dry spell, it's actually supplying a tiny amount of water, but it's also like a vitamin boost. So I do it particularly for things like lettuce that are very leafy and they want a lot of water. If I know it's going to be a little bit dry, I will once a week go out and I'll spray. And it is very, very, very small amounts of actual nutrition, but it's like a vitamin essentially. So there's lots of micronutrients. And so the stomata on your leaves when the plants open up in the morning, they're actually taking that carbon from the air. They're absorbing some water even, right? Your plants are able to absorb water through their leaves. You're just putting a little bit of nutrition on there and it's just going to suck it right in. And you're going to have a much more immediate reaction than anything you're going to do in the soil. So if you have a plant that looks like it's struggling or not doing very well, you can do uh, foliar feeding as like a med an immediate amendment and then add a little bit, turn a little bit of fertilizer into the soil. You're going to want to add something for the roots too. But uh, fish is, you can use the fish emulsion. I do not make any money from this company. It's just what I use. I think it's great. It's ground up fish guts, emulsified fish guts essentially. Um, you know, if you've heard the uh, planting a fish with the you know, it's the same, same thing, right? Um, and the other thing you can do is make a compost tea. So if you guys make compost at home, you can essentially brew a foliar feed for your plants. So you take some compost and you put it in water, Google it so you know a little bit more specifically. You leave it for a couple of weeks, that water is going to absorb some of that nutrition and you can apply that to your plants. So you don't want to apply it to let, like head lettuce you're going to eat the next day, but you know, if you're going to wait two, two weeks is the waiting period. So if I'm going to use a foliar feed, I have to wait two weeks before harvest. Um, but that's a great way to just give that little boost of nutrition to the plant. And something that I haven't really brought up is like healthy plants make healthy people, right? So you want your plant to be full of vitamins and nutrients because you want to get the maximum nutrition out of your plants as well. And then to till or not to till, um, is your soil compacted? If you haven't been gardening very long or you're going to a new spot and it's pretty compacted, doing some kind of tillage is maybe a good idea to get it started. So trying to start completely no-till on a soil that hasn't been taken care of is maybe not uh, the best thing. And is your soil very low in organic matter? You might actually want to incorporate some compost into the soil. And then how enthusiastic are you? How much digging do you really want to do? So we can go really quick. I think we'll skip the video. I have a video, but um, maybe we'll put this online. Double digging is a really good way to get a garden set off on the right foot. And then don't step on it. Don't put a foot on it um, once you do it. So essentially what you're doing is you're removing the top foot of earth, um, essentially creating a grid. You can see the person standing right here while they're working. They took off the first uh, you know, foot of earth, and then they used a garden fork to loosen the foot underneath. So you're not digging two feet down, but you're using a fork. You're loosening that up. You're creating that pore space. And then you're moving to the next area, and you're put, putting that st first top foot over the area you just loosened up, and then loosen up. So it's essentially you're kind of working your way over, so you're not carrying or moving soil, except for that first little bit of soil very far. But it's a good way to establish like a loose soil. You can mix in compost at this time too, so if you want to stir some compost in as you do this, go through this process, it's a good way to start and aerate your soil, getting that 50% pore space that we talked about uh, earlier. Um, so if you don't have a very loose soil, something you can do is get a coat hanger, straighten it out, try and stick it into your soil. If you can get it in a foot, foot and a half, should be pretty moist. If it's really dry out, there's actually, it's not going to go quite as far. If you can get in a foot, foot and a half, you're probably okay for compaction. If you like hit in a hard pan and you can't really get it through or you have to use a ton of force, that's a good indication that you might want to start to loosen your soil a little bit. Um, and if you don't want to go all the way to double digging, using a garden fork, putting it all the way, pulling back, but don't flip, step out, push it in, pull back, as opposed to like totally inverting the soil, that's a good way to loosen it up. It's a really good exercise. We do it in the greenhouses all the time, you know. It's kind of fun, but it's not the same like lifting, hauling that can be a little bit more uncomfortable. That's a great way to kind of um, 
you know, you could do a test plot. You could loosen some and not the other and see if you really needed to even loosen it to begin with. Because that's the thing is, it's, you know, you're setting, trying to set yourself up for success and there's things we've always done. So doing something like just spreading some mulch and sticking a plant in the ground as opposed to like all the work that we're used to doing can be a little scary. So do a little test plot for yourself and see maybe if just one corner of your garden um, what you can get away with. And then watering, don't overwater. Um, I really think overwatering is, is one of the m biggest problems I hear people talk about. It's like one of the first things that I, they tell me they have diseases, and I think, oh, there's probably too much water. And if it's a year like last year where it rains almost every day, like you can't really do anything about that. Um, and always water the soil. I'll emphasize that again. You always want to be watering the soil. You don't want to um, get leaves wet if you don't have to. I mean, with things like lettuce, it's not as big a deal, but there are plenty of fungal um, uh, there's plenty of fungi that will exist on lettuce that will start to rot the leaves. So if you don't have to, don't get the leaves wet. That's like the only picture of my son in here. I should have put a lot more. Um, I have a red-headed son. Can you believe it? I couldn't believe it. Um, <laughs> my husband has red hair, so I really shouldn't be surprised, but um, I was surprised. Um, so variety selection. This is a really good thing too. So if you're just going to the garden center and you're just getting whatever Lowe's has, Lowe's does not care how your garden does. They care about whether you buy that plant or not. And if it looks really great in the pot, awesome, good for them, you bought the plant. But a lot of times plants that are coming from a garden center have stagnated within those pots for a long period of time. Just think about it like the food being shipped from Israel or whatever. They're potentially not as healthy and they've been fed chemicals in order to sustain that sort of bluish green healthy look that they have. Um, so thinking, and they're not necessarily growing varieties that are um, good for our um, ecosystem or our climate. So we have, you know, they're all getting chipped up from wherever, Florida, um, bringing potential diseases with them from Florida. Um, and adaptability is really important. So if, a, in this, I could go on for a really long time and I'm going to stop, but um, <laughs> seed is another really important thing, right? A seed is not a seed is not a seed. Like there are so many differences in the genetic potential of each seed. And so if you're saving some of your own seed and you're doing it based on what tasted the best or what did the best, you are creating an heirloom essentially, and that is going to perform the best in your garden. Whereas if you were to take a seed that does really, really great at your cousin's garden in Oregon, and you plant it, and you're going to be like, this is the worst, you know, beet ever. Like, it barely made a root. Like, it, it, there's clim the climate really influences the success of any crop. And so thinking about trying to source from seed companies that are regional and trying to, because the small regional seed companies care about local growers. Like, it's just like a farmer. They care about the people in their community because that's their customers. That's who's going to come back. Um, and looking for things like vigor, high and heavy yield, um, a standard variety. If they call it a standard, that means lots of people grow it. It does really well for a lot of people. Widely adapted and great flavor, of course, right? Like we're home gardeners. We're not growing because we need it to look perfect so somebody will buy it. I mean, maybe me. I do kind of grow some varieties because the zucchini's straight and very green or, you know, what people want. But at home, you can pick for flavor. And so that's what I always tell people is when you're reading it, make sure it says great flavor. If it says good flavor, if it says improved flavor, if it says like anything but excellent flavor, if I was only gardening, I wouldn't waste my time with it. So that's just something I like to say. And other things that you might keep in mind is long harvest window. So a lot of times things, um, I mean, like a pea plant. Like I actually grow peas that are going to give me all their peas within two weeks because I have people who are standing there going like this and I want a lot of peas on that plant when they're standing there. Um, but you would probably want to pick a pea plant that's going to give you a four week harvest window or a five week harvest, maybe five week harvest window. Um, because you're at home and you're at the garden and you want those peas as long as possible. Um, good regrowth and side shoes, something like a broccoli chop that one head, you've got no more broccoli, but lots of them will grow side shoots and you can have more broccoli. Um, and does well in any soil, and then the good disease resistant package. If you can get great flavor with a good re disease resistance package, like that is a variety worth growing. Go ahead, we can go to the next one. And then spacing, don't crowd your plants. Really important, you know you only have a little bit of space and you want to grow every single thing that you ever wanted to, but your plants do not want to be crowded. Um, 
Just think about we didn't want to get the leaves wet with the water. Crowding your plants, you're reducing airflow, you're creating these moist, dark, dank environments. Like every plant would want to live on a Mediterranean terrace. Think about that like perfect weather, not too humid, not too hot, get enough water. So if you're crowding your plants in there and you're not following proper spacing, you can actually um, really do more harm than good. So control yourselves. Don't put too many plants, or think about what can be intercropped together. So if we think a little bit about, um, oh, we'll go ahead. We can go to the next slide. There's some, go some good books. Um, there's the Square Foot Garden. This is a really good one if you're going like, from basics. It kind of lets you know how many plants you can plant within a square foot. So you can have one cabbage or four Swiss chard. That actually seems excessive to me. Um, or 12 radishes. I think you could have more radishes. You know, so this is kind of, or wait, it's 16, so that's good. Um, but it's a really good way to kind of get an idea about plant spacing. And they're always going to tell you on the seed packet, or you can Google Donnie's Selected Seeds. At, I buy a lot of seeds from them. I try really hard to support everybody else, but they're like such, such a good company. Um, and they have really good growing information on their website. So if you're ever wondering about plant spacing, they have very, very good, reliable plant spacing and details about growing on their website. Um, and then there's the biointensive method. We all think about rows and grids. Think about hexagons and circles. You can actually get a few more plants within that space um, because you're thinking about the space between every plant as opposed to just the rows and the grid. So that's another way to, to squeeze a little more in there. Um, and yeah, just the recap. Fertility, take care of your soil. Watering, don't overwater, but keep your soil moist, spacing. Um, varieties. And then I, th I must have taken the slide out, but the uh, go ahead and go to the next one. I just, oh yeah, sorry. I didn't take it out. I was put in the wrong spot. Um, so extending your season. So you can succession plant or double crop. Um, so if you plant lettuce, it's going to go in. F for us, we grow a seedling for four weeks. It goes in the ground for four to five weeks and we pick it and then there's nothing there and the lettuce is going to grow back. So we replant it. Um, so that's something you can think about in your garden. If you're growing something like lettuce, radish, carrots, um, beans, peas, something that's going to, um, you know, be harvested and then not, you're not going to have an empty space. Keeping something like lettuce, radish, beets, Swiss chard, kale, a lettuce mix, spinach, something that you could, like, plant a seed in that space, you're going to get a little bit more out of your garden. So keep in mind, like, when you're planting your garden, keeping some extra seed on hand so you can just fill in those spaces. And don't be afraid to keep planting. We plant beans as late as... Uh, the 21st of July. We plant spinach until October. Um, that doesn't need protection. So thinking about what you can kind of squeeze in there. And then if you want to, you could build a cold frame. Go ahead, you can keep going. Protected growing is the best. If you can build a greenhouse at your house, you can make a little one. It is so amazing. Um, and that was just a little bit more about succession planning. Go ahead. Um, yeah, we're just going to have to do another class because I can't do all the details on this. Um, but double cropping. So this was the example. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Radish followed by lettuce. Um, just really quick, I said it. Spinach, kale, mustards, lettuce, basil, cilantro, dill, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, beets, carrots, radish, turnips, kohlrabi, scallions. Those are all vegetables that we plant and then plant something else after or before on our farm. So we do lots of double cropping. About two and a half of our acres see two crops every year. Um, and then September 15th is the last day you can direct seed crops with 40 days to maturity or less. So that's a good date to keep in mind. Go ahead. And then the intercropping. So this is peas growing up a trellis since they've planted spinach along it in the bed. That's a great idea. That's going to create some space. Same thing I was talking before. If there was uh, tomatoes growing there, you could plant lettuce or spinach or basil or something alongside it. So thinking about how to like take up that space. Go ahead. And then you can use transplants uh, to just stay ahead of the weeds. Uh, I think transplants are great. If you can grow them at home, that's awesome. Um, Direct seeding what you can, as long as you know what it looks like when it germinates, is a really cost-effective way to grow. Um, but for things like tomatoes and um, peppers and eggplants, if you don't have a transplant, it's a little bit harder to get fruit uh, to maturity in New England. I'm going to skip the greenhouse. You should all build one. Cold frames, you should all build one. <laughs> Seed ordering, you know how to order seeds. There's the recap. Let's just go to the last slide. 
Okay, there's two more. The last thing I want to say is harvest your vegetables. So that's another thing I have people tell me about. They come to the farmer's market and they be like, I have this zucchini. It's this big. I'm like, that's not what you want. You want to pick them. So, you know, if you grow crops like a peas or beans or zucchini, anything that's fruiting, they really respond to being harvested, right? They love, it's like, because, well, I'm going to anthropomorphize them a little bit. They're like, they don't have the will the same way you do, but their goal is reproduction, right? They're trying to make babies so that there can be more plants. And if you keep taking their babies away, they're going to keep making more babies, right? So with tomatoes, it's not the same because they already have mature seed in there, but really trying to keep picking, keep picking, keep picking, you're going to get, you're going to get more. And then for things like lettuce, you growing this beautiful head of lettuce and it's so lovely, it's going to get nasty if you don't pick it because it has... Um, chemicals in it that are bitter right and so it's going to start to make seed and it's going to start to get really bitter so if you see that beautiful head of lettuce and you really want to eat it cut it and eat it and plant something else so that's the, that's the last thing i'll say is if you're growing a garden don't hesitate eat your vegetables that you grow that was great thanks to the holliston garden club and Brittany for all that great information i can't wait to get out in my garden this is deb moore for how does your garden grow